Abraham on my dog tags. I had taken religion off because we were warned not to put H on the religion because it would be too dangerous because I'd end up in a concentration camp. So I took it off. But when he saw the name Abraham, oh, Yudah, Yudah, Udah, bang, 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 and there he proceeded to sock me and he knocked me in the jaw and to knock me across the room. I got I was unconscious. I woke up and there was this German guard with, a, with his rifle stabbing, gemming me in the back, and I got up. I was naked. And I put on my clothes as much I could, and that's how we entered Stalag number four. And we stayed there at Stalag number four. We were in compound. Our compound was made up of, of Americans, and it was another compound of English. And uh, we had maybe, a, and they had a couple of English, and we had a couple of Americans. And uh, they were, they were, they were, they were brutal. One, we were walking around the camp one day, and I had, and I had somebody who was, uh, was he was smoking a cigarette, and uh, from around the corner comes a major with his leather coat and his monocles and his hat, and uh, my friend had a cigarette in his mouth, and he saluted this major. German major with a cigarette in his mouth. And all of a sudden, the major screams out, Come into here. So we stood there, you know, we don't want to screw around with a, with a, with a German major. And, he, and then he starts to scream at this guy because he had the cigarette in his mouth. He hauled off and knocked him right on that jaw, this friend of mine. And there he was on the ground there. I had a, I had a job waking him up. And it was that that on and on and on with, uh, with the, but then the Red Cross came in with the, with the, with some instruments and uh, we didn't have a radio but we had radio men from the plane and we used to bribe the German guards to uh, and they put the knew how to put the radio together and of course if the Germans saw us finding out what was going on in the world they would have come in and shot a few of the guys but. We used to have good lookouts, and lookouts used to say, the crowds are coming, the ferrets are coming, watch out, and then we'd hide the stuff right away. But we knew what was going on in the outside world, and we knew that the war was going to be coming to an end. It's just a matter of surviving because of the food that we ate. And um, I organized a German class for my German school, just the phrases for them to give me give me a foyer, or uh, uh, speaking some German language. And I did get about 10 or 20 guys into a, one of the rooms and was teaching them. And then I organized a Connecticut club. I wrote a letter, put it in the latrine there, and said, anybody from Connecticut want to meet at a certain time? Sure enough, there were about 20, 30, 40 guys showed up, and we talked about the, what happened here. One gal never forget, forget from West Hartford. Um, he lived on Staples Place. Um, and he, he, a lot of uh, prisoners came in, and um, I see a young kid, and I yelled out, anybody from Connecticut? And this young kid, about 18 years old, says, yeah, my name is such and such, I forget his name. Uh, he says, hey, I'm from Connecticut, I'm from West Hartford. Blo filthy, dirty, <laughs> when he parachuted out, he landed in a, in a mud pack, or in, in a water, or whatever. And so I took him into the latrine, I helped him take off his clothes, and I washed him down <laughs> like you wash a kid. And, uh, and uh, uh, then we became friendly. <laughs> but, um, okay, now we're in Stalag 4. And uh, come fall, who's coming again? The Russians. They're at our camp. They're coming in. Germans get us out. February, and that article here, yeah. which I have, they, we started out in a blizzard. With, the, with all that we had and clothing was our coats and our boots and our hats and no other clothing at all. We were on the road for 86 days and slept outdoors. Everybody had pneumonia diphtheria. We lost a thousand American kids died on the march. That is what, what the effort was. 
There was nothing, nothing we could do. The Germans couldn't help us. So the guys that fell down, the Germans went over conveniently and shot them, killed them, dragged them into the woods, and that was it. Now, that, um, that was it. In, do you recall the barrack numbers you were in in Stalag with six and number four? Do you remember what barracks you were in? I think I was in barracks number eight, one of the barracks. And one before, yeah, I think so. Well, anyway, on this march, which is the worst march in the history of that ever, ever was on, and it's all detailed in that story there. The Germans could, they, they couldn't help themselves. Um, once in a while, we got into a barn. <clears throat> one night, one night we got into a barn and we're locked in. And all of a sudden, the door opens up, and there's a German colonel or major, one of these guys with these with the monocle and his and his hat, wearing a major hat and a leather coat and so forth. Deutsch. And some of the guys that knew me says, Hey Homar, go up there and talk to this crowd and see what he wants. I get up to the door there, the door was open, and the major was in there, and in German he says, Of Anige von D escapes from this from this from this in German, I forget the rest of it, from this group tonight, you will be shot. Schlafen Sie da, sleep here in front. So I'm standing there, and he says to me, uh, Alpha Moyle. So, what are you going to do? Not open your mouth? So I opened up my mouth. I stood there and I opened up my mouth. He reaches into his holster, pulls out a luger, and he proceeds to shove it right down my throat. I thought he was going to, but he had his finger on the trigger. I thought he was going to kill me. But he didn't. But I was spitting blood for quite a while afterwards. Hmm. And the march continued on and on and on. And we slept outdoors. We did get into some barns. We had nothing to eat. Sometimes guys would jump into a farmhouse there and grab some food and we'd eat it. We built a fire on what little food we were carrying. And then we ate the wood. We ate charcoal. I remember the, the doctors we had on there on, on, on us were fabulous. There was a doctor, Pollock, an English doctor, and I can still picture him with his cane and his uh, English accents and whipping us up to, but don't we go, it's going to end someday, it's going to end. Then there was another doctor, Kaplan, an American doctor uh, whom, whom I knew. And uh, when fellows fell, when guys fell, uh, oh, we, we had lice. Every one of us was crawling with lice. Can you imagine living with lice and diet and, 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 and uh, with uh, uh, diarrhea? We had, we had nothing to eat, but we ate, yeah, we, we ate charcoal. We ate wood. I remember I went to this Dr. Pollock one time. I said, Doctor, what have we got? What, what, do, you, what do you got for. for um, for diarrhea. Come on, what do you got? Give me some advice. He reached in his pocket, he poked out a, uh, some charcoal, and he gave me charcoal. And I ate the charcoal. Yep. I ate the, not that it did any good, but imagine not having your clothes off at five to ten below zero. It was unbelievable. One night we had to go through where the Germans were throwing the V2 bombs to England. And so instead of stopping and not marching until about, about 7, 8 o'clock, we, uh, we had to walk through uh, and, and uh, they wouldn't let us sit down until 11 o'clock at night. Mm. We slept, and we slept outdoors in that weather. How we, that's why a thousand kids, about a thousand kids died. We finally ended up, oh, another story. <clears throat> We're ready to come into things are coming to an end. We're, we're hearing rumors that that um, that we may <clears throat> we're going to be may, maybe coming to another prison camp, Stalag 11B in Fallibossel, which which was only a couple of days away. And I hear two guys. I may have told you the story. Two guys are planning to run away, to break away, and so forth. And I said to the, I didn't know, I didn't even know who they were. And I said to both of these guys, you know, 
you know, you you sure you, you you shouldn't. You should, don't 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 start up. You're going to get killed. They didn't listen. All of a sudden, they had, we had a German guard right right on the side of us, and he was half dead too, was from the walk from the march. And so they bolted off for the woods. They get about 40, 50 yards, and suddenly the German guard looks up, and he says to the, and he and he he gets down on his knee, and I see him. I would finger on the trigger, and I said to him, and I said to him, please, nicht schießen, nicht schießen. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I didn't know what the hell to do, so I great, let out a great big yell. They heard me. They threw the pack off their backs. They threw the pulled their pants down. They believed we were going to the John. And the Germans did not fire. I've been looking for these two guys for the last 60 years, never able to find out who they were. Other than that, they'd have been two dead, dead people. Sure. Yeah. Wasn't for you yelling. Yeah. I was, I was, I was a maverick. I, I had a lot, of, a lot of nerve. I, I don't know what, where I got it, but I, I always felt sorry for somebody else. I still do to this day. I, I see strangers on the streets, and they know I'm still working, and I hand out if I see somebody picking up cans or doing anything, then I have cookies in my car. I'll call them over. I see the policeman and one of the, uh, out there on the road there with traffic. I call them over, come on over, and I have to slide it on because they're afraid to take it. But but I can't help it. You know, I feel I feel so sorry for everybody. Everybody I feel sorry for. I can't help it. That's my that's my life. And uh, whatever I whatever I'm making is money wise, I'm giving it away. Of course, to my family, of course, but that's what I'm doing. Well, anyway, to continue on with the story just a little bit more, <clears throat> we're at Stalag 11B, and there must have been 50,000 prisoners there. They were all in the circus tent. We slept on the ground. There were Israelis. There were Indians. There were uh, all just about every nation you can think of. That's where they all accumulated. And we were there for a few days. And food was scarce. You can't feed 50,000 people very much. Sure. So what you do, so I had a little bit of luck. A friend of mine and I were walking through the camp. And when we saw that the German guards had disappeared, but we could hear shelling and noise in the distance. And so in the doors, were, the gates were unlocked. And in the in the uh, in the compound comes a jeep, and in it was a war correspondent from the New York Times named James McDonald, war correspondent and a British captain. And he stopped by us, and I have the article to prove it. And he and our parents did not know if we were still alive because after three months of not here, we used to be able to. When we were in a prison camp, we were able to send a postcard a month, one postcard a month. And all of a sudden, no postcard for three months. So what would you think? And then and in Germany. So <clears throat> I said to this James McDonald, so I stopped him and he stopped, he came over to running he kept, when the Jeep stopped by, I said, Mr. McDonald, he told me to introduce himself. I said, Is it possible for you to get word to our parents? that were still alive. He says, I'm gonna try like hell. And sure enough, a couple of days later, in the New York Times, there's an article about prison camps being, being, uh, uh, being covered, being uh, released. <clears throat> and among them was, to Staff Sergeant Abraham S. Homer, 18 Afton Street, Hartford, Connecticut, and Hyman Cothler, Bronx, New York. <clears throat> and uh, the, um, put it in the paper, and some family in New York saw my name in the paper. <laughs> they couldn't believe. They phoned my folks, and that's how they knew that I was still alive, and uh, I had name also. And then we were taken to <clears throat> Brussels, Belgium, 
and uh, we were deloused. We were we were recaptured by the British, and uh, we were in Brussels for a couple of days, where they deloused us about 20, 30, 40 times, and they gave us a British uniform, and we walked into Brussels, and. Uh, and it just so happens, we went through an area, the red light district, and there were these women up there yelling, come on up, come on up, we want to see you. We had no money, we had nothing. We want to see you, come on up, have some fun, and so forth. Here we are, we're just about half dead. And so we waved to them and, you know, oh, okay, we'll be back. We finally get to a building where we see a lot of Americans, a lot of Americans going up to a... Uh, a USO center, and I said to the side cobbler, what do you say, let's, um, let's go over and see what's going on. We climb up the stairs, and down comes a director in a uniform, and says, and here it is, an American, and he sees two, two Americans in British uniforms, and he says to the fellas, can I help you, what's going on? I said, we're two Americans who just got liberated out of Germany, and uh, what's going on here? When he said, this is the first night of Passover. We were liberated the first day of Passover. And he says, uh, he says, come on in. He says, come on in. I want you to sit down. I want you to have dinner with us and so forth. So I sat at the head table. And there must have about five, six, seven hundred American men and women in uniform. And I had to get up and make a speech in front of that whole group. And everybody gave me a rounding ovation. And uh, it was really, really nice. From there, after Brussels, we were taken to um, uh, La Havre, France, where the ships were sunk in there. It was real big. But there was a ship there called the George Washington. It was a hospital ship. But they said that they would take some, some uh, American, they would take some ex-prisoners of war home. So... We got about a hundred prisoners there. But while I was there at Cap Lucky Strike, I'm walking along with my high cobbler, and all of a sudden, a new group came over from England, and it was one of my high school graduate friends. And he broke out of the ranks, and he came running over to me, and he knocked me down, and he sat on me, and he started to hug me. He says, everybody thinks you're dead. <laughs> so... So um, then, when we, then they wouldn't let us eat anything. At the in the when we got liberated, a lot of people went in and started eating some eating food. They would start grabbing and chewing food. We had some people that died here. They got through all through German prison camps and survived, and they died from just overeating. overeating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much weight did you lose? Do you recall? How much what? How much weight did you lose while you were in the camp? Oh, I weighed 120 pounds when I got out of Germany. I must have lost about 60 pounds on the march. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Then, on top of that, <laughs> I ran into a, to a major. Somebody said that there was a major in finance. We had no money at all or anything. So I went over to this major wood. He owned, at one time, he owned a uh, radio company or, or television company or something here. And uh, I, I said to him, I hear you're in finance, and gee, I'd like to get some money. And he pulled out about $50 worth of money. Wow. He was a major, and he gave it to me. And he says, I don't want it back. He said, I just wanted you to come home. When you get, do get home, I want you to go to my house on Ridgewood Road and tell my wife that you saw me and that I'm okay, which I did. Not, and I gave her back the money. When I got home. This is in Hartford? West Hartford, okay. and Ridgewood Road. That's where he lived. Okay. Then we get on this hospital ship. The war was still on. It wasn't over yet. <laughs> and there were, uh, we had to have a, we have a, have a big export. There was a thousand wounded on that ship called George Washington. A thousand wounded soldiers heading for New York. And so we pull into New York Harbor and, um, uh, Take a look at New York Harbor, which was, I didn't know what day, the date it was. I don't think the war was over yet. No, the war wasn't over yet. And we looked, we're up on deck, about a hundred of us. And there was a couple of friends of mine on the ship with a fellow named Red O'Brien who had graduated high school with me. 
And I said to him, Red, he came over to me and he said to me, look, he says, nobody's allowed it. He was in charge of the mess hall. He was, what, I don't know what you call it, kind of a, of a, a, stu a, stu a steward or something. Yeah. He was in charge of everything. He says, go over to the mess hall and tell, mention my name and tell him you'll take back anything you want. Because we were sleeping in hammocks on the way back. It yeah. was a big group. So I used to go over there. They would jump into the mess hall there and take out all kinds of ice cream and candy and cookies and so forth, bring them back. Everybody said, where did you get all this stuff? We're crying out loud. How, do you, how come? I said, so, well, I happen, just happen to know the, the guy that run the place. <laughs> yep, Red O'Brien. And uh, boy, they were tickled pink. We pull into New York Harbor and we're up on the back and we're, we're got our hands on the banister there looking at like, New York and all of a sudden, the lights of New York opened up in front of us. We came in the night that it opened up. That's great. That, that was really, really, what a, what a, what a oh, there wasn't a dry eye uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, on the ship. Mm. They took us off, and then we had to be rehabilitated. They wouldn't let us come home, you know, just like this. They took buses, took us to uh, Camp Dix in New Jersey. And Camp Dix in New Jersey... We uh, we were uh, given lectures for almost a week and fed and so forth to try to clean us up to, to, to go home for R and R. So I went back to Camp Devons. From De Camp Devons, I called my family that I was in Camp Devons for somebody to come and get me home, and my mother with some friends, the same friends that picked me up at, when I was in uh, Rensselaer Field came speeding down and uh, picked me up, took me home. And when I got home, what a surprise. I must have had anywhere between one and 200 people at my house. That's great. Everybody, was, everybody was with pies and cakes and, and wanting to feed me. Yeah, we're, All we're ready to feed me from a guy, yeah, being a Jew and coming out of Germany and from what I was involved with, that 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 that, that was a miracle, and um, and uh, like I say, it, 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 a lot of luck, uh, skill, uh, no, the, the mostly luck, <laughs> and then I was coming home to spend uh, about two or three weeks here, and then I had to report back to Atlantic City. And I reported back to Atlantic City, and I was interrogated by the uh, United Nations or the, the FBI and the CIA. And I did turn in that captain that had, I knew his name that had uh, been involved with uh, sending the what the um, the, the uh, young the German youth in to beat us all up, and uh, especially that German that uh, German. Uh, uh, guard, the one that uh, the, 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 German, the, hand, the hand hands, but I found out later that he was captured and he was killed by the by our soldiers. They killed him. And so I went to, yep, I was interrogated there for three, four, five days. And um, they wanted to send me to Lake Placid, New York, for the winter. <laughs> And I just come back from a winter that I was frozen to death. To recoup. He said, where, where do you want to go? Do you, will you go to Macon, Georgia? I said, sure, I'll go to Macon, Georgia. So I went to Macon, Georgia. And then I was in Atlanta most of the time. And the people there, they, were, they didn't know what to do for me. They fed me. They had, uh, everybody was looking for me to sleep in their house. And uh, from there, they discharged me and came home. When you got out of... Um service what did you do for work uh <clears throat> let's see when i got out of work let's see that when i got out of work my father worked in a had a ginger ale company but he didn't own it he was a distributor so i went ahead and i bought the company and let my father and work for my father to distribute the ginger ale and so forth and I was doing fantastically well because the sugar shortage was big. However, after a year or two or three or four, no sugar shortage. Plentiful. I was fighting Coca-Cola, 
Pepsi Cola, Seven Up, uh, all the big big companies. They went in and they wiped me out. So I sold out to Pequot Ginger Ale, became a supervisor. And while I was a supervisor, um, I enjoyed it, but not that much. And I used to see people going into stores as a liquor salesman, the sicker personnel, a liquor salesman, checking shelves, carrying a briefcase, talking about liquor, talking about this and beer and so forth. I said, that's what I want to do. So I knew a friend who had married the daughter of a liquor owner in Hartford named Max Lewis, Alan Grody. And I said to Alan, Alan, I'm going to leave your sister who had taken over the Pequot ginger ale because she was just, just no good. He said, don't do it. He said, I'll come after you one of these days. He married her. He married Margie Lewis, Max Lewis' daughter. And sure enough, uh, one day he and a salesman went to, to the uh, Oktoberfest in Germany. And the salesman said that he was going to be leaving the company. And that's when he got a call one night. Uh, are you ready? I said, I'm ready. And soon enough, that was 47 years ago. And I'm still in the business. And I do very, very well with the, with the, with the company. That's great. Yeah. I have some other questions. Sure. Um, being a Jewish, did you incur any anti-Semitism? Um, during and the basic Germans? Train, no, not from the Germans, but during basic training from other Americans? There was a couple of, there were some incidents, but I wasn't involved. But there were, I was in Lincoln, Nebraska. <clears throat> and we had... We had one guy that used to, in the morning, get up and pray, and we were had I had I had had a hernia operation while I was there, so I was laid back for for a, a class, a couple of classes, and uh, another barracks, and so in this barracks was a fellow that was happened to be religious, and he had one of those things around him. They call him a talus around his neck, and uh, he used to pray in the morning, and. Uh, I used to, these fellas, fellas were from down south, and I guess they were anti-Semitic or whatever you call it. And uh, they used to ridicule him and so forth and so on, but he didn't pay any attention to him. But I didn't run into too much, too many, too much. Yeah, so, well, did, did, can you tell me about the decision not to identify yourself as uh, Jewish on your dog tag? How, how did it come about? Oh, we had we had the intel our intelligence come over to give us letters to give us the uh, uh, oh what do you call it to give us to give us answers or to give us um, a briefing a briefing briefing on what to do if you ever got caught as a prisoner of war. And uh, we went to quite a few of them because they wanted to tell us what to expect. And I went up to this officer and said to him, if you were a Jew and you were flying over Germany and you had and on your dog tags, if you had an H on your dog tags, what would you do? He said, I want you to go over to, to where they make the dog tags and get another set of dog tags and put nothing as far as religion. And that's what I did. And I think that saved my life. Other than that, I'd been killed. Absolutely. But with a name like Abraham, kind of some people, when they found, that's when I got beaten so severely by that, by that ham hands. And that's why you say, I was named after Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you were in uh, the, the POW camps, did you... Um, Ever practice any of your um, your traditions, you know, the Passover or? Uh, no, but there one thing did happen. I had a guy that had a little prayer book, and he was going to throw it away. And so what I did is I said, "Give it to me. I still have it here." And I walked through Germany with everything with that little prayer book in my in my pocket. That's great. And I had a good list of names of fellows from Canada and so forth on it, and I kept that little prayer book. He was scared, yeah. but I decided I was going to take a chance. Did you, um, 
you know, you had mentioned that you had got together with um, fellow guys from Connecticut and uh, so forth, but did you ever, um, I know, you, did you ever get together with our fellow, fellow Jewish soldiers or airmen when you were in the camps? Did you have that opportunity or not? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. There, were, there, were, there were a number of other Jewish uh, in, 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 uh, in the prison camp. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I knew of a whole bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that many, not that great, but of course there were thousands. Right, and you thousands. Didn't really want to make that publicly known. No, 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 no. You didn't want to. You didn't want to talk too much because we had these ferrets around all the time. These these yeah. German guards say, a lot of them were. All, all, uh, some of them didn't mind. They had families in Chicago and they had families in New York and if when the war was over they're going to come back to the States and so forth. But then you had some other rough ones and the guards especially were, that were shooting all these guys. It was, it was terrible. Yeah, was there, when you were in uh, the, the POW camps, you know, did you ever, um, was there ever talking like a mass escape or did you ever really consider that? Um, when there was a mass escape, they killed them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, there were tunnels. Yes, the Germans did. They uh, they would come in. From, oh, I have to tell you this. In the winter, all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, the door would open. In would come in about a dozen Germans with dogs. Rouse, rouse, they would yell. Here we are in our underwear, underwear, in our shorts, in our underwear, sleeping. We would have to go out in freezing weather. We would have to stand out there in a cold, cold rain or snowy weather while they searched the barracks for anything that was detriment. Especially the stove, because that's where a lot of them used to dig down underneath the stove. And of course, they knew that there were a lot of underground uh, yes, yes, there were a lot of underground tunnels dug. The British especially dug a lot, a lot of tunnels. But uh, we used to stand out in that cold, freezing weather for uh, who knows how long. We didn't have any watches, um, and we would that would that would uh, we we uh, we'd stand there and we'd I'd be absolutely frozen. How would you heat your barracks? Would, they, would the Germans give you coal or wood? All we all we had was a coal stove. And they used to supply some coal, and we put it in. But it would, it, it would during the night, it would, uh, it would blaze out, and that that would be the end of it. Okay. It's always cold in the barracks, freezing. Oh, the Red Cross used to send us in some, some uh, records, and we had a record player, and uh, sure enough, here we are, six thousand <clears throat> miles away from from the United States, one of the records was, I'll be home for Christmas. I'll be home for Christmas. And you should have seen the tears that rolled up in eyes, because most of us saw we'd never get the hell out, never get out of Germany alive. Yeah. If Germany won the war, did it killed all of us? Sure. Sure. Especially guys like myself would have been eliminated right away. Yeah. Sure. Um. While you were in England, what did you do for R and R? I'd go to London. Yeah. On the plane, <clears throat> on the plane that I went, there were cigarettes. They were transporting cigarettes, but they didn't know where the cigarettes were going. So there were cases of cigarettes. That's fifty cartons of cigarettes. So I said to the crew who were going to come back to, from the United after they dropped us off, they were going to go back to America and bring some more guys over. Uh, I'm going to take some of the cigarettes. Take what you want. I arrived in Scotland with a case of 50 cartons of cigarettes. Case. Case, yeah, 50 cartons. And I was able to carry them to my barracks. And would you believe, I was giving, every time I went to London, I used to put in 10, 20 packs of cigarettes, 30 packs of cigarettes, and I'd go and have dinner somewhere and so forth, and i see these people, they're, they're, they, they couldn't afford to smoke them in England. I used to pass out cigarettes. I could have sold them for maybe 5 pounds, 20, 10, 10, 15 dollars. I never sold a pack. I always, here, I needed my shoes done. Barger. 
yeah, I, I needed some shoes fixed. I go into a to a, to a to a shoemaker and I tell him I need my my shoes fixed, and he tell me a month. I pull out a pack of cigarettes. How long? An hour. <laughs> I gave it all away. I swear I never sold a pack of cigarettes. I go and I see these old people there in London, the London area there, and um, just pass out the cigarettes. We went back on a reunion uh, m years ago to Bassingborn, <clears throat> and uh, the mayor was there. A lot of people from the town were there to the airbase. And while the mayor was making a speech, and uh, the crowd of people from Royston, Massingborn, and uh, the mayor was saying, you Yankees, I remember when I was a small boy, you Yankees used to give me some gum. I bought a carton of gum and brought it over for the, just to give away. Mm -hmm. So, after he's right in the middle of a speech, and I let out about the gum, I let out a big yell, and everybody turned around. We had about a couple of hundred from the from our group who also went back. So it was a big crowd, and the people from the town. So I said to the mayor, so I said, let out, when I let out the yell, and everybody looked around to see who's that crazy guy yelling. Mm -hmm. So everybody stopped and became quiet, and I walked up to the mayor, and I says, do you remember the gum that we gave you when you were? I said, I'm giving you the gum right now again to remind to remind you. <laughs> and sure enough, he, oh, what a, what! A, everybody got up and gave me a standing ovation. That's great. We're at um, and the same thing. We're at the uh, museum where all the old aircraft are, you know, the, a flying field that England put in. They had a flying fortress in there too. Yeah. And so I took my wife in, and most of the guys around the bus also were, went in also. So everybody left, and I lingered along, you know, the, myself. I was on the plane there looking at where I was and so forth. And um, all of a sudden, the door opens up. In walks about 100 young kids, 10, 12, 13 years old. And they were coming to visit the museum of old aircraft. Sure. And so I had a big badge on me saying uh, American uh, Air Force uh, uh, reunion to England. And a couple of teachers saw my badge. Sir, and meanwhile the crowd that was in with me from the bus had left, and my wife included. So I was the only one at the bus left. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, when they came over, and he said to me, Sir, the children are on a field trip, and they would love to take a picture with you. So I said, Okay. I knew that I had to get back to the bus, but I figured, Ah, oh, what am I going to do? And so each teacher brought its class up, and they all had their little little cameras, and they all took a picture of the American hero <laughs> with all the young kids so they could show it. And it took about a half an hour, an hour. Well, then I wondered, I knew I was going to be in trouble. Then I wandered back on the bus. <laughs> and guess what happened? Everybody gave me the claps. Oh, I'm telling you, yelled. They all yelled, including my wife and, and everybody else. They all yelled and clapped and so forth, which was good. I must have felt. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We went back a couple of times. Then I went back to Paris. Um, with uh, my grand, my daughter was graduating high school, and so I went back to Paris by myself for another reunion. And um, and one of the reasons I wanted to go is because I had selling all these French wines. They were they were asking me to come back to visit the wineries and the champagne industry. So. Um, I met a friend there, and he wanted me to go to Scotland with him, and I said, no, I'm sorry, I can't go with you to Scotland. I got to go down to, to the champagne, uh, in, to where the champagnes are made, and uh, uh, outside of London, about 100, 200 miles, Reims, they call it, Reims. That's where Eisenhower, 
for Eisenhower uh, uh, declaration, the war was over. And so I get off the plane, I get off the train, and uh, I'm met by Prince René, Prince, um, oh, I forget the Prince, uh, Prince Pauline, Pauline, and uh, put me in his big car, took me to a high-rise apartment house, and uh, that overlooked the uh, where Joan of Arc, where Joan of Arc was ordained and so forth. Yeah. And I'm up there in the waiting room, and I'm looking around, and I see people, a lot, a lot of activity going on. Jeez. And so I said to myself, geez, some, some important person, they're waiting for some important person. And uh, I see a whole load of people come in, then they go into a dining room then, then he come out, came out and got me and sat me down. <laughs> I was the important person <laughs> that was being honored by Prince Pauline of the, uh, of the, of the, of the champagne company. I said, I sold the champagne. I had to get up and make a big speech about France and all. Sounds big great. standing ovation. Then I told him that I had to go to another, to another champagne company. And sure enough, they took me to another champagne company. I went down down into the cellars and uh, saw the way they make the champagne, how they store the champagne and so forth. And they wanted me to stay for a night over, but I didn't uh, didn't want to stay and so forth. But it was it was it was a nice trip. And the day that I was there, um, what's her name died? Uh, the, the great singer. I forget her name. Judy, who, who was there when I was, when, Judy? Oh, it'll come to me. I bring what some. What year was this? 60 in the 60s or something like that. 60s Garland? or 70s. Judy Garland, yeah. It was Judy Garland, yeah. Um, did you ever want to go back to uh, your camps or ever see where that was? No, was not really. No. no. no I've been to Paris twice, three times. Not Paris, but London three, two or three times, and Paris a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. Is there any uh, any other stories you'd like to add? Anything else? There's a lot of them, but the old brain doesn't doesn't bring back. Yeah. Let me see. But flying in combat was so dangerous. Five thousand bombers over Germany lost. Fifty thousand men. I don't know how many did. Oh, on TV, they had a list of all the cemeteries. Did you happen to see it? Yes, I did. You did? Yep. Did you see the one in Cambridge? Um, I, I, saw, I saw this episode, and I remember... Yeah, the one in Cambridge where Glenn Miller is? Sure. Oh, I, I, I was there. Okay. Yeah. Um, after we went back to the, to the Bessingbourne, we went over to Cambridge, where to see 5,000... 322 Americans missing in action. Missing in action. No bodies, no nothing. Oh, I don't know what's underneath there, what, what, what is underneath. And uh, I went in and gave, met, met the gatekeeper there. And while I'm going through the cemetery there, there were other Frenchmen that saw, that saw me there and they saw my badge, Reunion American and they came over, and they were so elated to see me. And they said over and over again, if it wasn't for you Americans, there would be no France. They were so, they were so delighted to tell me over and over again, without you, France, no. And that, it's true. It's Very true. Good. Oh, the whole world. Hitler had the world in his the palm of his hand. If he'd have gone over to England, he could have walked across after Den after Dunkirk. <laughs> after Dunkirk, he uh, they had they had nothing left. Yeah. They had they left all their tanks. They left all their guns, the big guns. They left everything there. Uh, Why he didn't go over there? Because all he had to do was take that army and throw it on the Russian front, and the world is gone. Yep. With, uh, now Eisenhower said. There couldn't be a D-Day unless we destroyed the Luftwaffe. And in the week of February the 22nd, February 18th to the 23rd, 
the weather was supposed to be a perfect weather for bombing. And, and that, this is the week that we had to knock out the Luftwaffe. And we did. When D-Day showed up, only one plane showed up on the beach, made a pass, and went away. Other than that, other than that, they'd had thousands of planes up. They'd have killed every, instead of 9,000, they'd have killed 100,000. They'd have killed everybody. They'd have sunk every ship in the harbor. Yeah. They, 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 they couldn't help it. Um, of the, when your plane went down, of the crewmen, how many survived and how many perished? Okay. All right. The four, um, the pilot was killed in the plane. Navigator was also killed. The bombardier was killed. I got a letter from my, from my co-pilot who said that when he was ready to go out of the plane, he looked back and Frank Colts, the pilot, 22 years old, was also behind him. And when he went out, he thought Frank was behind him. He wrote me a letter to this effect, that Frank was behind him. But the plane went into centrifugal force and he was pinned in the plane. G-force couldn't, couldn't get out. Couldn't get out, yeah. Once the plane goes down, spin, you're, you're pinned. When, you were when your plane was hit and you were and you just made the decision to uh, bail out, were, was the plane descending or was it uh, flying steady? Um, yeah, oh yeah, we were flying steady, sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, we were leading that group. And we flew just like, the, you see the, the, the geese upstairs flying. Right. You geese. see the way they go by, That's the, that was our formation. The formation. And then, then even nobody wanted to be tail end Charlie because the Germans went in from the back and they would knock out tail end then Charlie right away. We were supposed to be the, but instead of coming out of the sun like they were, they were coming, the frontal attacks. They started their frontal attacks and that was it. They figured if they knocked out the lead plane that they would knock, knock the whole formation out. Can you uh, tell me again your your the name of your bombing group and your squadron and... 91st Bomb Group, 323rd Bomb Squadron. And you recall your... There was 320, 323rd, 3, 322nd, 323rd, 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 324th, and then the 401st. Four squadrons equals one group, 48 bombers. Do you recall um, your day of discharge, what day you were discharged? Uh, the day I was discharged, I think I got a copy right here. Oh, it had to be August. Now, when you uh, were liberated from um, the camp, I was liberated February. I was liberated April eighteenth of nineteen forty-five. When you were, um, I was shot down February twenty-second. Fourteen months of hell. When you got wind of. Um, when you got back from Germany, in back you know back to the United States, and the war was still going on with Japan, did was there any um, chance that you might have been sent overseas again, or were you done? No, 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 no. We, they they knew that we had enough. Right. We were physically and mentally, we were not. We were. They they knew how we were tortured. They knew it. Now, how were you? Um, because Who? you were still in the army. How were you paid? For all your time when you were in the period of oh, camp. Oh, in the period. Oh, we uh, nothing. We weren't paid anything except our. Uh, we were getting uh, base pay, which was eighty dollars a month, and hazardous pay. If you were in hazardous, another uh, thirty, forty dollars. I think another thirty, forty dollars a month for for combat pay. <laughs> one hundred and twenty, one hundred and ten dollars, something like that. And out of that, we elected to send home send home um, some money if we wanted to do that. So everybody sent homes like $35, $40 a, a month to, now, to their families. Were you actually physically paid in England and given cash? And yeah, we were paid in England by the, uh, the regular pay and the, the, the $35 or $40 was mailed to the parents. Now, um, when you were, obviously you weren't getting paid when you were uh, in captivity. What, how uh, did you retrieve that money when you got out? How did that? Did you get paid when you before you shipped out to the United States, or when you got back to the United States? Did they give you all that back? back? Um, let me see the back pay. You know, I don't even remember what the back pay. 
because that must have been a nice big chunk of money. The 14, it may have been a couple of thousand dollars, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's because $80 doesn't amount to a hell of a lot. No, but it adds up. Yeah, I know. 14 months. Yeah. Okay, well, I think, uh, I think uh, if I, you want to add anything. Um, no, I tell you. You know, between the death march and the, the parachuting out and it's quite a story. badly wounded and uh, a lot of things. And I and I, I stuck my neck out a lot, a lot of times. I could have been killed at that, that guard when I, if I hadn't shouted for those two guys. The guard could have turned around and put a bullet in me. Sure. And then, and, 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 uh, and, and being in an airplane at 30,000 feet, if the parachute didn't open up, here, here I'm going down with a collapsed parachute. Here I'm, here, here I'm in a jail for five days where the, the blood had caked up. Could have died from blood poisoning. Sure. I wanted to ask you, um, did, did uh, the crew, did you, yourself, or the rest of the crew, did you guys have reserve parachutes or just one parachute? No, just one parachute. Okay, okay let me tell you, as of now, who's alive and who's not gone. The pilot was killed, navigator was killed, the bombardier was killed. The co-pilot survived. He's been through three wars, and I'll tell you about him. Okay, just let, let, let him go for a minute. Sure. Since then, uh, my other flight engineer passed away. My radio man, who I helped to save, I could have I could have asked for a medal on that there, but I never even I never even bothered. And uh, the two gun the tail gunner and um, uh, ball, turret. Ball, ball turret gunner all passed away. That left my co-pilot. He went on three wars, World War II. Uh, then he went on to uh, become a pilot. In the uh, for food, I went into Berlin, the Berlin airlift. Yep, the Berlin then he went into Korea, yep. fought in Korea, and then he fought in Vietnam. Wow. A couple of weeks ago, I get a call. Well, we visited him in Florida years ago. Just got a call that he passed away two weeks ago. It leaves me. Oh, there's a picture of the crew. And you're the only survivor, correct? I'm the only survivor left out of my crew. Yeah. What, what, well, we so backtrack to your radio man. Did you find it? Well, to all your crew. He did passed you, away a few months ago. Did um, were they all at the same POW camp? Did you ever run into any of them? Um, the no. Person? The officers were sent to Stalag Luft Number Three, the officers' camp. Okay. The others were sent to Stalag 6 and 4, but I never saw them. I never, I never ran into them there, because there's another prison camp called 17B down south in Germany. So, but they may have been in the camps, may have been in another, another there were different Stalags. Okay. You know. Now, um... Your radio man, did you ever hear how bad his injuries were? Yeah, yes, well? he survived. He, he, he was from New Jersey. He, um, um, he went on to become a CPA. A CPA. And... Uh, here, it's best, best. Here, here they are. Here, take a look at this. <laughs> <clears throat> and he passed away just about a few months ago. Yeah, if you want that copy, you can keep that copy also. Because when I get onto my when I get onto the company that I work for, I usually make up some extra copies. Right. You know that I was in the West Hartford parade, and it was raining. And I told the rain to stop, and the rain and the rain stopped. I just want to look at something. I don't want you to hold it up. Yeah. Okay.
So you got a better picture there? I can't find it at the moment. That's, here, you can hold that up. And you can tell me your, your uh, fellow crew members. Yep. <clears throat> can you face it towards the camera? Sure. Um, let's see, bottom, bottom line here. Okay. This is Harold Alexander. That's my navigator. This is Frank Colts, my pilot. This is uh, Edward White, my bombardier. And this is um, Ed Merkel, the one I just mentioned, who was uh, my co-pilot. Okay. This is uh, Hill, he was the tail gunner. Grant Quist, he was one of the uh, uh, waste gunners. Uh, he and I, this is Cryjack, and this is me. This is John Goros, and that's, uh, oh, I forget his name. Let's see, Harold's, oh, from, from Texas. I forget his name. I'll come to it. No brainy, what it used to be. <laughs> but it comes here later on. Yep. Okay, Mr. Homer, I think uh, we're going to conclude this interview. I, uh, again, I'd like to thank you for your time and your service. Okay, well, no, my pleasure. And I appreciate you. I appreciate you coming over. Um, now, it's a story you can't forget. A story that everyone should should know. Um, thank you and